Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. Today we're talking about another Malamar variant, this time starring a very powerful new Tag Team GX Pokemon in Eevee and Snorlax. So let's break down the deck. Starting off with a basic concept as always, I really think Malamar's in a good spot uh, thanks to Team Up. It gains a lot of new toys, uh, Jirachi, Viridian Forest and um, some other stuff. Obviously there's a couple of the tag teams that both have potential in Malamar. So there's definitely ways to explore this deck. I feel that Eevee Snorlax provides a really, really nice GX attack option in particular for this deck because the current GX attacks that are in something like a Gas Can, there's the Black Ray GX attack, and then there's Dawn Wings as GX attack. Obviously, if you're ahead in the game, you can't use Dawn Wings, and the Black Ray is situational as well. So it's been dying for a really good GX attack. And Eevee and Snorlax really does provide that big one-hit KO, whilst also drawing up to 10 cards in your hand. Like, that's a huge reload for a Malamar deck. It can oftentimes secure you a way to, you know, Guzma a last two prizes to win the following turn. So, I think in, like, the mid-game, this really helps give Malamar a lot more control that it used to not really have. You could do a sort of all-in Guzma play in the mid-turns now, knowing that you have a way to go back up to 10 cards afterwards. It really does increase the tempo of this deck a lot. Whereas in other times you could be like, yeah, I need to Guzmo, but I also need to make sure I have a hand for next turn. You don't really need to juggle that anymore because the Eevee Snorlax fixes it all for you really nicely, which is awesome. Another thing is, if we do move to a DC build to, you know, incorporate the Eevee Snorlax a little bit easier, we can add in Onyx. And Onyx is actually a pretty good attacker in the format because of Pikachu Zekrom tag team coming out, uh, as well as the ever-present Zoroark. So I think it just offers a really nice uh, non-GX attacker for the deck as well. So, let's break down the Pokemon. We're going to play two copies of Jirachi. Um, this consistency buff is really nice. You'd love just sticking an escape board on this guy, promoting it into the active so you can do your psychic recharges everywhere else, and you can dig a little bit further into your deck with Jirachi. This is obviously just an awesome card in the game, and it's going to be played in a bunch of decks. We're going to maximize the Malamar counts uh, because all of our attackers are really expensive. And if we get like three Mallys into play, sometimes we're not relying on hitting one of our DCEs, which is good. The Onyx, as I just mentioned, he's here for being brown. <laughs> he can uh, one-shot tag team Pika, Zekroms, and uh, uh, Zoroark, so that's good enough on his own. Uh, yeah, just a flat 120. It's actually not bad in sort of like non-GX trade-offs. Obviously, a lot of the time we're looking to hit 130, but we do have Distortion Door on our side to try and set those things up for the Onyx, so... We try and have a good army of non-GXs available to us with a couple Onyx and a Giratina that can always recycle itself. So we hopefully present enough non-GXs in those sorts of matchups. Then we have the good old Eevee Snorlax Tag Team GX. 270 hit points. We're a fighting type, which isn't really too bad. I mean, we have to only ever be afraid of a Lycanroc, really. We're not scared about Buzzwall because we're a psychic deck anyway, and we can just try and use Giratina in that matchup. Um, but it offers three really nice attacks. The first uh, is just for single energy, and we're allowed to attach an energy from our hand to one of our Pokemon, so this can get some extra, like, burst if you just happen to uh, lead the Eevee Snorlax. He could even power himself up to use Dump Truck Press, his main attack, on turn two. Um, it does for four colorless energy cards, 120 plus 120 if your opponent's active is an evolution, so... We're going to be able to knock out even, you know, the majority of Stage 2 GX Pokemon. It's only really stuff like Metagross that gets around it. So this is going to be hitting the most relevant stuff for one-hit KOs all the time. And that's what makes this card very, very dangerous. Alongside its GX attack, which is the biggest selling point in my opinion, it does 210 for four uh, colorless energies. But if we have that fifth on there as well, we get to draw up until 10 cards in our hand. So it's a huge reload for this deck. Like I said, trying to get us like late game Guzmas or a few other key cards that we have in the deck. You know, like uh, finding out uh, more DCs for the following turn. Stuff like that is going to be really huge. Uh, then we have the one copy of Giratina. Distortion Door helps fix some numbers for us. So even against the likes of uh, Metagross, we could maybe one-shot them. Um, and it's also going to be nice just for setting up like 130 hit point Pokemon and stuff like that. It's just a real nice math fixer. Whilst also being a non-GX attacker that can keep restoring itself with its own ability uh, to keep spamming shadow impacts. So we have, you know, although we only have three slots dedicated to non-GX attackers, we can uh, chain them as best as possible. Wonder Crosma GX, obviously its light's end ability might be good in mirror matches. 
Uh, but the Prismatic Burst Attack is going to help us against 180 hit point basic GX Pokemon um, and 190 hit point and stuff like that. Like Zero Auras and Tapu Koko GXs. Snorlax isn't actually that good at dealing with them unless he's using the GX attack. Uh, so having an extra Necrozma GX in here just for Prismatic Burst is going to be pretty nice. Um, then we have Tapu Lele GX. It can get really powerful with Energy Drive because we are playing DCEs in here as well as the Malamars. So bear in mind it can be an attacker. It's Tapu Cure GX attack is available to us as well if we're facing down spread. But it's mainly in here just for that Wonder Tag. We have so many outs for Lele with 4 Ultra and 4 Treasure that we're going to have good consistency at trying to find something like a Turn 1 Lily or just Guzma whenever we need it. Stuff like that is going to be pretty clutch. Onto the items and stadiums. Uh, I'm actually playing one copy of Max Potion in here, and I'm normally very much someone who's against playing one-off copies of cards in decks that doesn't have, like, like we're not playing Volkner, so it doesn't make sense to play, like, a one-off item a lot of the time. But in this deck, if we use a Snorlax GX attack and then play an Erica's Hospitality afterwards, we probably have a hand of around 15 cards. And that means we have pretty good outs of, of finding a Max Potion. And I think Max Potion can be a big enough swing in a game when Eevee Snorlax has 270 hit points, we can just max potion and get a new attacker into the active. Maybe even that same uh, Eevee Snorlax if we do like some switch Guzma Shinans. Something like that. Um, would be ridiculous. Or switch into a skateboard Jirachi. Stuff like that would be insane. Uh, so I think healing off your Eevee Snorlax is a big enough deal that it will swing games. And I feel like the one of is justified when this Malamar deck in particular can draw so many cards. Then we're going to play two Rescue Stretchers. Obviously, trying to chain the Mallies is going to be as important as ever, and our important attackers to recycle as well. And then we're playing lots of Ball Search. Three Nest is obviously good for getting Inkays, but also Jirachi in the early turns, and your attackers, as well as just the four Ultra and Treasure, which can obviously discard Psychic Energy, which is what we're always looking for, whilst at the same time trying to set up our board. Two copies of Switch. Um, so yeah, we're playing a Switch and Viridian Forest sort of engine, in here rather than uh, something like Ultra of the Moon, which is more sort of standard in maybe like Ultra Necrozma builds and some gas cans. Um, but the Onyx and the Eevee Snorlax both have four retreat costs, so the Ultra is not usable. Otherwise, you would definitely be seeing something more similar to an Ultra Necrozma where it plays Ultras plus Acrobikes. I still like Acrobike in Ultra, and I'm not sure if I play Viridian Forest or not. I'm still trying to figure that out. But in this deck, it's a no-brainer. The uh, Ultra of the Moon is terrible, so we've got to play Switches. And that does enable us to play two Viridian Forest. It allows us to discard a card from our hand and search out an energy card, a basic energy card. Uh, so it can help us access those Psychics early. And of course, Counter Stadiums are so huge in the format right now because of all the Prism Star Stadium cards roaming around. So it's nice to be able to bounce those. And finally, the two Escape Boards that love finding their way onto Jirachis and sometimes like Inkes in the opening turns, stuff like that. So... I like these little extra switching cards. I think two copies is just enough. Field Blow is in low enough counts at the moment because people need physical stadiums to bounce like Black Markets, Wonder Labs, Heat Factories, all that sort of nonsense that's roaming around. Uh, so I feel like usually two copies are fairly safe alongside the switches and Guzmas and stuff that we have anyway to get value from Jirachi. On to the supporters. Um, I mentioned Erica's Hospitality. Yeah, we're going to play three copies of her as well as three Lily and three Cynthia. And three Guzma. So three of, of every supporter. This is really me not not really knowing the best supporter for uh, the deck. I, I feel like at times I want to have that fourth Lily. At times I want the fourth Erica. At times I want the fourth Cynthia. Uh, it's really strange in this deck. We have Lele so we can get Lily turn one like if we want to in a good amount of times. Uh, but oftentimes you don't want your board to be like a Jirachi, a Lele three Malamar and then just one attacker. Sometimes you want to have others being charged up in the background. So I felt like I still wanted to have a physically high Lily count just for those turn one odds. But then Lily gets so weak, especially on the turn that you use your Snorlax attack. So does the Cynthia. It gets rubbish if you've just used Snorlax as GX. That's why I definitely wanted a high count of the Erica in here um, because it gets such good value after you've used that Snorlax GX attack. It's, you know, other than Guzma, by far the best supporter you can go for. Um... And Cynthia is still just Cynthia. It's nice and safe in the early turns, nice and safe any time in the game. So I wanted to have decent counts of all of them, really. And um, it can definitely be one to experiment with. I can definitely foresee dropping to two Lily and then going either to the fourth Cynthia or the fourth Erica, whichever one is like the highest performing card. For now, I don't know which is the highest performing card, so I'll just have a three of split of each. Let me know which you think uh, sort of 
that hammer should go. Should it go to the left or to the right? <laughs> and uh, we'll see how it ends up. Onto the energy, we're playing 4 DCE and 7 Psychic. Obviously, the Viridian Forest can help pull out Psychics a lot easier, so I don't think we need to go too over the top. With these energies, we can scout them out quite nicely thanks to our stadium. I think it should be still enough to, you know, get into the bin and recycle, and the DCs are obviously vital for this deck as well. So here is the full list. Pause now if you want to. It's also in the description as always. But on to the tech stuff. Um, I had a real headache of which attackers I wanted to fit into this deck. Um, because we've seen Gascan and how versatile it can be, there's always worth consideration for some of these attackers. Dawn Wings provides extra switching if we need to, as well as a nice comeback GX mechanic in Moon's Eclipse. I think right now I'm so happy with Eevee Snorlax's GX attack that I really rarely want to use Moon's Eclipse. Let Loose is always an option. It can uh, be a win condition at times against some of the clunkier decks and some Stage 2 stuff. Um, Deoxys can attack just on turn 1 with a DCE, and that makes it pretty encouraging to think about putting in as a 1 space, maybe dropping 1 Onyx for 1 Deoxys. And the Marsha GX is also worth considering because half the reason Malamar will be wanting to use these tag teams is that you don't get the downside of losing three prizes if you use a Marshadow GX. I think because we already have a couple Onyx in here, we don't really need the Marshadow for type coverage. And I feel like we just sort of play safe with the Eevee Snorlax when we can. Put him down when we know we're not up against a fighting deck or a deck that plays like Weavile or something like that. That's the only time where we feel pretty comfortable to put the Eevee down. If not... Um, we just sort of don't play him, I guess. But you could still play one Marshadow in here just so that you don't have the downside of an Eevee Snorlax. Uh, the other tag team that you could consider is the uh, Gengar Mimikyu. Once again, I think a huge selling point of this deck in particular is Eevee Snorlax's GX attack. So I don't want to be using Gengar for their own GX attack to slow people down. And I feel like his own attack cost is a little bit... Like his normal attack, Poltergeist, is just not uh, reliable for damage output. The final thing I was thinking of was getting some f sort of thin spread package into the deck. Maybe if it was just like one Arceus, two Coco, and maybe one Psychic Lele. Maybe even a spread package without the Psychic Lele. That would improve our matchup against uh, Persimian Coco, which would otherwise be awkward because Shining Arceus uh, protects us. It also improves our uh, Zapdos Jirachi matchup because we could do some ultimate arrows and flying flips to knock out you know, multiple Jirachi and Zapdos at the same time. And it's even good for Mirror. If you can just spam your Shining Arceus with our two Rescue Stretchers, we can knock out all their Malamars at once and really give them a hard time. Plus, we're an annoying 130 hit point Pokemon, so it basically forces them to use their Giratina, which gets even more spreads onto the board because of its own attack. So, because we're playing the DCEs, it opens the door for Shining Arceus and Tapu Koko. Both are definitely reasonable cards, and I think very good in the meta, especially for our bad matchups, which I'll talk about now. So if we, uh, if we wanted to put the spread stuff in, we could improve some of these bad matchups, but we would become more clunky. I think that's really the only bad thing I think about uh, Malamar variants. I think uh, you can get outraced by the likes of Lost March and Zapdos and Tool Drop. Uh, obviously Zapdos, if we played the Arceus line, we could try and sort of jump over some knockouts with like Jirachis and Zapdoses. We could obviously get spread knockouts against Lost March. Uh, Persimian Coco, we would defend ourselves with a Shining Arceus. So I think that would be my first port of call, trying to wiggle in a Shining Arceus and a Coco. I think it'll, it'll be hard for sure, because uh, I've tried to fit them in, and I've obviously seen their value. But yeah, it's a lot of work to try and work them in. It's kind of risky to drop to one Onyx. It's kind of risky to drop to one Eevee Snorlax. Um, <clears throat> so I feel like I don't really want to, want to make those cuts unless I absolutely have to. Um, and I don't really know where else the cuts come from. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, the Pazimian Coco is just a bad matchup when you don't play, uh, that Shining Arceus. So, answers on a postcard where we fit in Shining Arceus into this deck. Uh, because I think it's actually really strong in the meta for covering this deck's bad matchups. I think against everything else, this deck is versatile and, uh, quite powerful, to be honest. It may be a little bit slower than some of these other builds, but I wouldn't call them outright bad matchups in any right. I, I think we have the answers to at least be 50-50 against most things and uh, maybe favoured against a few as well. So my closing thoughts are Malamar's really interesting me, this expansion. I think uh, there's so many directions we can take Mali. There's this DC route I talked about today. Ultra Necrozma gets a fresh coat of paint as well with a few new cards. Gas can may sort of 
stay similar to how it used to be, but it also gains some new toys to explore. Aerodactyl I've already profiled, and Spread. I was just saying how this deck uh, wants to use Shining Arceus for a number of matchups. Well, yeah, why don't we just go for a full Spread deck and um, have those matchups really positive for us instead, and then have weaknesses elsewhere, or trying to sneak in, you know, like one EV Snorlax just for matchups where Spread is bad, you know? That's an option that it's never had before, and now it has insane one-hit KO potential. If you come up against something like a Gardevoir with max potions, you could just EV Snorlax your way through them as like a one card answer, and Spread is really sort of dying for something like that, so that would be awesome. I think this build in particular really wants to see Pikachu Zekrom players and Zoroark players. I think that's where it's going to be its bread and butter matchups, which is always something tempting to take to a tournament. And I think the late game draw option is one of the coolest things for a Malamar deck. I really think it's underrated. Uh, I've seen so many Malamar builds trying to work in, like Zeb Striker with Ditto and stuff like that. And that's because they're just yearning for more draw power, basically. Um, they play so heavily. They're very reliant on the board most of the time. So they get away with, you know, relatively low hand sizes and just relying on Lilies and uh, Cynthia's to grow their hands. But... Um, now that we have this sort of mid-game option, I think it's absolutely incredible for giving this deck a real breath of life. And I think it it really does push the archetype. I, I really like the Pikachu... No, sorry, the Eevee Snorlax GX attack. I think it's awesome. The only downside is that if we have a slow start, we don't have the comeback mechanics of the likes of Dormings or Ultra Necrozma to pull us you know, back into the game. Yes, the Eevee Snorlax like, draws us more cards to have powerful turns in future. But if we're just losing a flat-out race... Uh, we can't get back into the race without the help of, you know, trying to just throw non-GXs into the active or just hoping that EV Snorlax can tank. I think the way we could try and, like, recover some tempo is trying to wipe a bunch of damage off the board with a max potion. That's how I've tried to go around it. But I think not having the natural comeback mechanics of Ultra Necrozma and Dawn Wings really is the only real downside I see from the DCU build. So let me know what you think about this build and your favourite build of Malamar going ahead. Um, I think it's really interesting. I'm definitely happy to explore Mali, and I can foresee it being, if not top tier, probably the top of tier 2, because it gains such a boost uh, from all sorts of different cards. It's very versatile, and it can patch up its bad matchups if you want to dedicate the space for text. So I think that's very encouraging for the deck, and I think it's going to be very strong going ahead. For now, though, it has been Joe from Omnipoke, and I'll see you guys tomorrow with another team-up deck. Cheers.